So you should have a outline, and on the bottom of the outline is your bibliography. And in this particular lecture, although I've relied on all of these works, uh, number four, uh, Church History and Plain Language, Bruce Shelley, which I would recommend to, to get yourself and read it, is the primary source of it. And then when direct quotes are given, uh, obviously they are annotated and specified. Have a quick look at your outline, and then I'll walk through it briefly <clears throat> in a general sense. And then as I pursue the lecture, I think it's most helpful for you just to look at the heading and, and as I give the information and commentary on it, then that keeps your mind focused on the heading. And if you choose to take notes yourself, that's fine, uh, whatever. So we have our introduction, obviously. And then uh, point number two, a Christian Roman Empire, who's the boss, OK? And that, that's the tension of state over church or church over state. Uh, point three, another hot button to push, the Crusades. So when we look at the Crusades, was it a blemish on the church history or just another war of conquests? That latter statement is extremely significant. And I want you, if you can hold on to that, were the Crusades uh, a blemish on the church per se or just another war of conquests in the chronicles of history? Uh, number four, scholasticism, that movement, Closed minds or pursuit of truth, did it launch the Reformation inquiry, which we arrived at Sola Scriptura? We'll look at that. The East-West split between the Latin church from Rome and then the Byzantine church in the East. An alternative view of the cross, which is, uh, I think, the big issue. Point number six, a call to reform wake up to the corruption in the church, and then number seven, the inquisition, confronting opposition. From the so-called simple first century to the now period of the second half of the Middle Ages, uh, many movements have arisen, and they've evolved into issues that are quite relevant today. And as I made this disclaimer, uh, before the true church and correct doctrine as we define it today compared to the church history we are pursuing. At, at what point is it no longer the true church for the sake of movement? We will leave a sleeping dog lie and use the term Christianity and the church lightly or loosely. And I made that disclaimer before because as, as we pursue this study, like I said, some of the distinctives of the church we're looking at don't at all match up for the most part, what we think they should look like. So as, as again, as we pursue this, we're, we're trying to wrestle with some practical issues, and as mentioned, relationship between the church and the state, uh, the Crusades in the context of the political dialogue today, and that term Crusades is used in a way in political language today as it sprung out of the so-called events of the history of that time period. So that, that's a very important uh, question we're gonna look at. And again, our emphasis is to see continuity and um, to, to move through and just pick out some general movements, study them, but then really work at how they apply to our life today. So the first one we're going to look at, and if you have your outline there, a Christian Roman Empire. Who, who is the boss? That's, that really is what it boils down to. And uh, we, we had studied the conversion of Constantine and, and the movement then of the church uh, more into a, an approved legal accepted status. But uh, then we saw so the synthesis of uh, many pagan beliefs actually being absorbed into the church. But that, that tension continued on, uh, who, who is boss, church or emperor? And in the midst of the fall of the Roman Empire and then the scramble for control in the backdrop of the barbarian incursions in the fifth, sixth century and following, uh, 
um, the, the Franks ascended. Now, they didn't ascend for uh, indefinitely, but that kingdom ascended as kind of controlling things. And the tension was still there, and we, we closed our last lesson with looking at Clovis. But what we want to shoot for today is to nar narrow this controversy down. And we're not going to answer it, but I, I just, I just want to leave you with this, and you know this, that oftentimes uh, power corrupts, regardless of whose hands it's in. So as we study this, this tension <coughs> excuse me, between church and the state and, and the fight for control, we realize that uh, ultimate power can cause a lot of damage. Is this tension still here today? Well, it is in many respects, but you know that our president visits the Pope, or visited the Pope. I don't, I don't know how many times he did, and I, I don't know what they talked about, but I'm just going to leave that sleeping dog lie there because there, yeah, there was dialogue there. Uh, uh, I'm sure that was off the record, but nonetheless. So this, this tension is still here, even to the present. And uh, what's gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to look at two scenarios here. Uh, I have a scene one and a scene two in your outline. So scene one is uh, about the ninth century, early part of the ninth century, latter part of the eighth century. And, and here's the scene. So there's a, there's a mutiny over Pope Leo III. So he's charged with perjury and adultery. Now, the mutiny is staged by the previous adherence to Adrian I. So what does Pope Leo do? Well, he calls for help to the king of the Franks. As I mentioned earlier, the Franks ascended in power at this point. So Charles the Great crosses the Alps and restores order. Christmas Day, 800, the Pope crowns Charles. So to quote Shelley, here's how the scene worked itself out. Charles, and I quote, the most pious crowned Augustus by God to the great peacemaking emperor, long life and victory. The Pope prostrated himself to Charles, the great king of the Franks, who has restored the Christian Roman Empire. End of quote. Now, did that mean from that point on, unequivocally, the Pope bowed in authority to the so-called Christian Roman Empire? No, it didn't work out that way. But I don't know if that was just a political statement he made or whatever, but it certainly didn't flesh itself out in that respect. But this, this Charles the Great is a notable figure, and you'll know him by the name of Charlemagne. And Shelley uh, lists three of his goals, and, and these three goals that he pursued uh, pretty much set the political order for Europe for the next thousand years for a nominal, quote unquote, Christianity. Number one was uh, a military power to crush his enemies. Uh, number two was a religious power to direct his people's souls. And number, number three was an intellectual power to, uh, let's just say, Im improve the nature of the individual's spiritual condition, soul and mind. So there's military control, uh, religious control, and then educational control. And this, this last one was very significant, this educational control, because out of it came a, a definite movement for education for the common person. Now, these schools would have arisen in monasteries, and, and in that context, and, and it eventually evolved into, quote, universities, as we'll talk about. The second scene that will paint the picture for us as far as this tension between the Pope and the temporal leader is over two issues. 
uh, investiture and simony. So, so these are terms that I think it's critical to understand what they mean in the, the working out of the relationship between the church and the state in the Middle Ages in particular, and even up to the time of Luther. So investiture, technically the appointment of a bishop or an abbot is uh, under the authority of the church and the civil authority. But it, it became dominated by the civil authority because of just the nature of the feudal system. And this other problem, simony, which is the selling of church offices, okay? And that, that was quite common. So we, <laughs> we don't just have that in the political sphere, but a, a study of church history will show you that uh, right through the Middle Ages and perhaps even up to the, the present in the ecclesiastical sphere, there is the selling of church offices. And uh, uh, that's another issue. So on the scene then, and this is scene two, to help us understand this tension between pope and temporal ruler is a man named Hildebrand, and he eventually becomes Pope Gregory VII. His time is about uh, 1073 to 1085 as the pope. And he, here, was his, here was his viewpoint now, and this is where we want to de define this tension a little closer. And to quote Shelley, uh, he claimed unprecedented power for the papacy Gregory held as his ideal the creation of a Christian commonwealth under papal control. So this is the 11th century or so. A, a, Christ, a Christian commonwealth now under papal control. So the conclusion to this mindset would be that the church should control the temporal. The pope was the boss, okay? Now, this, this didn't work out exactly as Hildebrandt wanted, but he did come on the top at the end. And here was the, is, uh, the issue. Henry IV, the emperor of Germany at this point, uh, appoints a man of his own preference to the Archbishop of Milan. He, he openly defies the Pope in this, and with the authority of his synod of German bishops in 1076, refuses obedience to the Pope. Okay, so what does Hildebrand do? Um, Hildebrand excommunicates him. And by excommunicating Henry IV, Hildebrand is able to say, well, um, you, you don't have to listen to him, the subjects. And this, this puts a fear in them. But the last act is Henry uh, coming to the Pope, uh, standing outside his castle, three days in the snow, uh, eating humble pie, doing uh, repentance, and eventually Henry was pardoned. But this, this tension continues right on into the Reformation between the papacy and temple rulers. And uh, just to jump ahead a little bit, and we, we won't deal too much with, when we do the next section on the Reformation, with the, the, the luminaries. We're going to deal with some of the, the rather, let's just say, unknown reformers because I think that you already have a general understanding of what occurred there. But with Luther, you know that he was tangling with Pope Leo X. Charles V was in the mix, uh, in cohorts with the Pope against Luther. And then we had Duke Frederick the Wise who saves Luther. Okay, so we had that tension there. And now just go 100 years later, and we are in England, and we have the uh, English Civil War. 1640s. So then we have the English king, Charles I, a staunch Catholic, of, of butting heads with the Puritans. And what eventually happens? Well, the Puritans execute him. Uh, and a uh, commonwealth is set up under Oliver Cromwell, and then that collapses, Charles II returns. So uh, again, there's this ongoing tension. Uh, through the Middle Ages, we see it uh, right through the Middle Ages, into the latter Middle Ages, even into the Reformation era. And if we're going to get a working knowledge of this era, we, we have to recognize this tension. Um, what would be interesting today, if, if there was a pope that took his religion as serious perhaps as these popes did, and maybe had some moral fiber 
and looked, at, looked to the West from Rome and said to certain leaders in our country, it says, oh, well, wait a second, the, you know, the official position of the Catholic Church is we don't uh, support what you're doing with the abortion industry, so I'm going to excommunicate you. Either, either you get on target with what the Catholic Church would say on this, which I'm assuming they would say. I think they have a, a mixed message now. But it would be interesting if you had a pope uh, uh, with that sort of moral fiber uh, that would pursue excommunication of so-called Catholics in our government. Uh, but that hasn't happened, and I don't think you're going to see it happen, at least at this point, for political reasons especially. So we leave that question and we move on to now another one, which is, as I have in your outline, a hot button to push, the Crusades. And the reason I say this is a hot button to push, because most people, we all do this, we, when we want to present our point, we, we try to be objective as possible, but um, and I do a degree, I'm, I'm the first one to admit this. We, we have selective amnesia about certain aspects of what we want to promote. And we, and we use sometimes, and as much as we try, we try to be objective. Uh, sometimes we just tweak things a little bit to, uh, let's just say, support our agenda. Uh, the hist we, we may look on previous history to defend our agenda uh, with, let's just say, not the full view of all the facts. And again, we try to do our best, but, and uh, the, the present situation that we're in, the Marxism that's overtaking our, our society, the, the cultural Marxism, the Freudian Marxism, along with other movements, uh, is, is very prone to broad brush previous history. And, and recalibrate the facts to sustain what they want to do. And the Crusades is, is case in point. And e even on the 4th of July, uh, one, one politician made this comment that, uh, well, this, you know, I didn't read the whole comment because I don't think I could have stomached it. But at least I saw this part of it. Well, you know, this country was built on blood. And I said, yeah. That, that's the nature of the movement of civilization, isn't it? Of, of conquest and submission. Uh, the, the winners, there's winners and losers. So in that, in that case, according to this politician, to, to substantiate their complete vilification on the present country that we live in because of the past, it, in my opinion, shows a very, very, let's just say misconstrued view of history and not really even living in reality to say, no, no, all, all of history is divide and conquer and submission. So as we approach this discussion of the Crusades, um, it's a very complex discussion. And I don't say that just to make an excuse for the fact that I have difficulty even fathoming it myself. But I'm no expert on it, but it appears when we talk about this movement in, these, in, these, in this time frame, in these two centuries, First Crusade being around uh, 1095 or so, and then going on for about two centuries, that uh, the original intention was to retake the lands conquered by Islam, as, as well as try to unite the two churches, East and West because they had officially separated in about 1064, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, but a little, a little background, I think, will, will help you understand your understanding of these crusades. So we, we date Muhammad about 570, and then by 640, uh, that movement had conquered all of Arabia. By uh, 670, all Palestine was conquered by, by Islam. Uh, by 690, all of North Africa was conquered. Eventually, uh, by the 8th century, half of Christians were living under Islamic rule. And then uh, eventually, about three-fourths three of the Christian world at one point was under Islamic rule. So that, that 
that sort of, I think, sets the tone for just the consideration of what they were trying to do. And back, back to my original premise, you know, it's, it's divide and conquer. And, and that's just the movement of history. But this author, which is a, a very interesting book, The New Concise History of the Crusades by Thomas Madden, and I'll read a section of this for your contemplation, but, but I, I want you to catch his perspective of how the Crusades are viewed by the Muslim world previous to the 20th century. And I quote, it is commonly said that the memories in the Middle East are long, that although the Crusades may have been forgotten in the West, they were still vividly remembered where they happened. Categorically, he says, this is false. Hmm. The simple fact is that the Crusades were virtually unknown in the Muslim world even a century ago. Let me repeat that statement. And this is a pretty bold claim, and he's, he is a substantial scholar, and he backs it up quite well. The simple fact is that the Crusades were virtually unknown in the Muslim world even a century ago. The term for Crusades, Har al-Sabib, was only introduced in the Arab language in the mid-19th century. The first Arabic history of the Crusades was about 1899 when it was written. So he goes on to say, Westerners may be surprised to learn that Muslims in the Middle Ages, or in the Middle East rather, have only recently learned of the Crusades. How, one might ask, is that possible? How could they not remember centuries of Christian holy wars waged against them? It must be remembered that although the Crusades were of monumental importance to Europeans, they were a very minor, largely insignificant thing to the Muslim world. So, again, who, who educated this group of people in the Middle East to the actual fact of the Crusades, and I quote Madden again, and he says, in books and colonial schools, European colonials taught the Muslim world about the Crusades. They were vividly described as heroic enterprises whose aim, like those of the colonialists, was to bring civilization to the Middle East. End of quote. So I, I simply state that to substantiate my premise that sometimes movements will use things of the past and, and recast them in, in an ideal which isn't true to substantiate their point. Now, that brings us to at least a, a consideration of this movement, and um, it was, for the most part, a complete failure. And um, yeah, it's a blot on the church, but again, in, in, in overall history, it's, it's just another war, series of wars of conquest until it was resurrected by certain special interest groups of the present time to vilify Western civilization. See, that, that's what we'll get at. But just a brief look at them. The first crusade uh, was called because at the Battle of Manskirt in 1071, the Eastern Emperor lost to the Turks. So... 1095, the Emperor Alexis I appeals to the West for help. And it, this was quite a desperate move because those church traditions were already split. I don't, I guess you could say their, their fellowship was very limited, if at all, but he makes an appeal to the West to come and deliver them from the, this movement. At the Council of Claremont, Urban II calls for the First Crusade full forgiveness of past sins, uh, along with many other goodies, as I've perceived. Well, this crusade was the only one that was, in some degree, successful. Uh, Jerusalem was retaken, a feudal kingdom established until 1187, and then it was recaptured again by Islam. That's only, that's only 119 years. The third crusade was the one that most people are probably somewhat familiar with, and this is the crusade that had Richard the Lionhearted, Frederick the Barbarossa, Philip Augustus, and this one was marked as well as the, some of the others by much fighting, massacres, and abuses. That's, that's not denied, that's not denied. But the interesting thing 
is these, these abuses were in different directions. Uh, yes, Christian on Muslim, but also Christian on Jew, uh, and then uh, other parameters, even Muslim against Muslim, et cetera, is very complex. And that's why it, we just have to be careful about broad brushing this movement, oversimplifying it, and saying, oh, woe is any church or religious movement because of you evil people, what you did in the Crusades. That, that's what I'm trying to communicate. Because, again, not to justify it, but by the same token, to, to put it in the right box. Well, the Fourth Crusade was another interesting one. And this one uh, was supposedly going to march down through Egypt and up. So when these crusaders came to Italy, uh, they wanted transport to Egypt. And the Venetians, from what I understand, says, well, we'll give it to you. It costs this much. They didn't have the finances to pay them. So uh, they cut a deal with the Venetians and say, well, if you sack the city of Zara, Hungary, that's part of the payment. So these crusaders sacked the city, but then they went on to sack and plunder Constantinople as well, which was, a, which was Eastern Christendom at that point. So nonetheless, the animosity <laughs> increased between the East and the West. And that's why I said, you see many, let's just say atrocities, and they go in different directions. But probably the most profound one, as far as just the travesty of it all, is the Fifth Crusade. And, and this one was what's called the Children's Crusade. So this is led by a shepherd boy uh, from France, and then a shepherd, another young man by the name of Nicholas from Germany. And they, they gathered thousands of children on this crusade. They made it to Italy, and the, the consequent result was they were sold into slavery in Egypt. So again, you see, and there was two more or so, and then some, the conclusion is, and uh, my opinion as well as just a general historical opinion, the, the overall enterprise which stretched over two centuries was for the most part, a failure. It didn't regain the lands. Uh, all it did was create animosity, and it didn't help with the relationship with the Eastern Church as well. Again, abuses in all directions. So, so we have to be careful that when we try to defend our actions of aggression by grievances of the past, let's get, let's get the facts, okay? And again, those who would take this again, bad blemish on the church of the Middle Ages and try to, to resurrect it to their own defense as, well, we're holier than thou because of look what you did uh, a thousand years or so ago. The, again, the, the true facts of it show that this, this was a, just somewhat of a buried movement until 200 years or so ago when the actual Western civilization taught Eastern civilization what really happened, and then the, I suppose you'd say the rest is history. But that should inform us, just by way of diversion, with, with this so-called reparations discussion in our own country and disciplining ourselves to look at previous history objectively, and then in that context, let's just weigh this out and say, well, is there culpable guilt to us many generations later? So we'll, we'll leave that one. And uh, again, I, I think a helpful look at history does maybe cause us to balance out our thinking. So if you have your outline there, we're, we're on to uh, this term scholasticism. And I have it there listed as closed minds or a pursuit of the truth. So this is an intellectual movement that ranged from about the 9th to the 14th century. And when I did that lecture on theology and science last year, I mentioned quite, quite a bit about the mindset of scholasticism because we did have to deal with Thomas Aquinas. But why, why do we want to just take a, a quick look at this at the risk of oversimplifying it? Uh, 
is because in my limited understanding, this, this is what Reformation thinkers rebelled against in, in some respects, if you want to use that term. So Shelley, again, uh, defines scholasticism this way, and I, I quote him, we call this period in history of Christian thought scholasticism because a distinctive method of scholarship arose and because a unique theology of the Middle Ages emerged. The aim of the schoolmen, as these teachers are sometimes called, was twofold, to reconcile Christian doctrine and human reason and to arrange the teachings of the church in an orderly system. Now here's the, let's just say, core of the quote. A free search for truth was never in view since the chief doctrines of the Christian faith were regarded as fixed. And now I'll state that again. A free search for truth was never in view since the chief doctrines of the Christian faith were regarded as fixed. And again, this, this movement is before the Reformation. It, it precedes it. But uh, as we will get into the Reformation next time, we will emphasize the idea of an inquiry of, well, what, what do the scriptures actually say, et cetera. But this Reformation, this movement, this scholasticism is, is, is built on the foundation of Charlemagne and what he had started back in the eighth century with monastery schools, palace uh, schools, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that just to get a little taste of this, we'll, we'll mention a few, a few biographies, which, which again, I think are helpful when we look at history in general. And if you're not interested in studying history, I encourage you to say, well, study biographies, okay, of people in history, and then what will happen, they, they will fit into the progression of the events of history and I think that you will become stimulated to study history. And I, I know that was my experience uh, 45 years ago, where in my early part of my Christian walk, uh, I was not at all a reader. But uh, once I started reading, and, I, and especially in the area of history, uh, pursuing interesting biographies, it, it gave me, let's just say, an impetuous to say, well, what's, what's the whole progression of this history that we live in as believers in the church? Some of these names you may be familiar with, others um, not, uh, probably not this one, Gerbert, 10th century, uh, and we know that name from baby food, right? It's Gerbers, I guess, I, don't, I forget whether it's Gerbert, but no. Uh, 10th century, he became Pope Sylvester, uh, his uh, papacy was 999 to 1033. But he was a master of a cathedral school in Reims, and his bishop sent him to study mathematics in Spain. But he had an interesting experience there that he was surrounded by uh, some Muslim scholarship, which came across to him as helpful in that it was, had a very inquisitive spirit to it. Another one, Peter Abelard, and this name is 1079, 1142, and some of you seminary grads probably know this, uh, his, his treatise, among others, Sick at None, Yes and No, 158 questions he posed, and he answered them from the scriptures, church fathers, and the pagan classics. But it appears that Abelard really embraced the spirit of scholasticism, and it, it was this constant questioning Okay, and that's almost, if you go back into the Greek, his, Greek philosophy, that's the Socratic method, I guess. But it's this, this constant questioning, and he fell afoul of the Roman church, and uh, Bernard uh, pursued him, and uh, Abelard was eventually condemned to heresy, and <clears throat> Bernard's statement was, the faith of the righteous believes. So that didn't sit well with Bernard, Peter Abelard, his constant questioning, okay? So if you can put, put yourself in that uh, domain, and again, that's 1,000 years ago, that now you have <clears throat> very intelligent men coming up from that system who are starting to ask questions and then using logic to answer them, 
but even more so uh, referring to church fathers and then pagan classics. So Shelley says this about scholasticism, and I quote, scholasticism developed in the context and came to stand for a painstaking arrival at logical conclusions through questionings, examining, and arranging details in a system of logic, okay? So it was a, a pursuit, questioning, and then arranging arguments in logical form. Uh, the big name here that you may be familiar with is Thomas Aquinas, and we date him uh, 1224 to 1274. And in the backdrop of the Muslim scholar Averroes, who had two very interesting perspectives, uh, he said that we, we can come to one conclusion just through reason, but then uh, we can come to another through revelation. And that was a rather dramatic statement at that time. And as I mentioned earlier, when Gerbert was exposed to some of this <clears throat> Muslim scholarship, it did actually school the scholastic movement, this, this inquiry mindset. But Aquinas, as you well know, probably is noted for Summa Theologica. And uh, this is his magisterial work, and he makes the distinction between philosophy and theology, between reason and revelation, and pretends there's no difference between the two. So his big mantra was reasons based on visible creation, full, but full knowledge of God came through revelation. This man, Aquinas, uh, along with this, sort of, again, re, re, let's just say, summarized the whole Catholic tradition. It had, it had been at this point, obviously, but um, he was big on the concept of the cooperative grace. And co cooperative grace is, as far as I understand, and having been raised in that system, that it is this idea that if one participates in the usage of the church's sacraments, then one can pursue salvation. And that was pretty much Aquinas summarizing that and putting that together, although the idea certainly existed up to then, but he pushed it through. And he, in the words of Shelley, he formulated a church teaching in a cosmic framework. So what was this whole movement, this scholastic movement, actually beneficial? Well, we have a century later, uh, on the horizon comes the morning star of the Reformation, uh, Wycliffe, and then John Huss, who begin to pick and, and tear at canon law, which, as far as I understand, this scholastic tradition would have promoted. But uh, Colin Brown, as I, is quoted in um, Daly's work there, he says this, in one sense, the Middle Ages were an eye of faith. The questions that the schoolmen asked all had theological bearing. Now, there was some rather obtuse questions that they asked. I won't get into that. But ironically, the questions which so preoccupied them were, were a hindrance to hearing the passage, the message of the Bible in and about God and his love in Christ. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, repeat that last statement. And I quote him, Colin Brown, but ironically, the questions which so preoccupied them were a hindrance to hearing the message of the Bible about God and his love in Christ. So this whole scholastic movement, again, it was the pursuit of knowledge at that time in a, in a certain way with questioning and lining things up logically. According to Brown, he, who is a great scholar, and you may have written or read some of his other stuff I have, uh, it really wasn't too productive as far as opening the door to a true understanding of the gospel. And that's a debatable point. But we will see, as I mentioned previously in the studies in the Reformation, now uh, the, light, the light comes on and people begin to pursue epistemology, what's true, uh, under the guise of, well, what's the revelation teaching us? So that brings us then to another uh, subject, and if you have your outline there, this, this east-west split between the church in the west at Rome and the church in the east 
at uh, Constantinople. When we, think, when we think of Christianity today, we usually think, well, the Roman Catholic tradition, the Eastern Orthodox tradition, and then Protestantism, us, okay? And then we have a smaller category under Protestantism, which would be true Protestantism, if we can say it that way. But th this split between the West and the East had been festering for centuries. So doctrines, practices differing, even as we made a quick annotation, when we looked at some of the councils, there was, there was controversy over the definitions of some of the things in the councils. And uh, this, this did eventually bring it to a head. And in 1054, there was a split. This, this growing divide came to a split in 1054. And that, that was the, the, the event that, I suppose you'd say, caused the official divide. And Shelley characterizes it this way, and I quote him, uh, one summer afternoon in 1054, as a service was about to begin in the spacious church of holy wisdom at Constantinople, Cardinal Humbert and two other representatives, legates of Pope Leo IX from the West, entered the building and made their way to the sanctuary. They had not come to pray. They placed a bull, an official papal document of excommunication upon the altar, and marched out. As he passed through the western door, the cardinal shook the dust from his feet with the words, look, let God and judge. A deacon ran after him in great distress and begged him to come back. Humbert refused, and it was dropped in the street. So this is supposedly, end of quote, uh, this is supposedly the divide. Now, just a little bit about Eastern Orthodoxy, and, re and remember, we don't, when we're pursuing the study of church history here, we're mainly going through the stream of the Western church. But they have, they have a different view of what salvation, the pursuit of salvation is. We, along with the Roman Catholics, although we solve the problem different, have a very legal view that we have to some way come up <clears throat> with satisfying the righteousness of God and his demands against us. In the Catholic tradition, as I mentioned, not to oversimplify it, <coughs> excuse me, but it does involve the cooperating grace, the seven sacraments, etc. In our tradition, we're way up there with Luther, sola scriptura, uh, uh, sola fide, faith alone based on the scriptures, justification by faith. <coughs> excuse me, that's, that's the foundation of our relationship in understanding the gospel to satisfy the legal demands of God against us, his wrath revealed against us because of our sin, satisfied in Christ. We understand that. We know what the term propitiation means. But in the Orthodox Church, their, their concept of connecting with God is, is different. And to quote Shelley again, he says this, according to orthodoxy, when man sins, he does not violate the divinely established legal relationship between God and man. Let me say that again to quote him. <clears throat> Excuse me. According to orthodoxy, when man sins, he does not violate the divinely established legal relationship between God and man. He reduces the divine likeness. He inflicts a wound in the original image of God. End of quote. So in their mind, then, salvation is renewing that full image. Probably, if you have any, uh, let's just say, exposure to the whole Eastern Orthodox tradition, um, it came under the guise of understanding what an icon is, all right? And what, what is an icon? Well, if you ever go into an Orthodox church, you'll see that. It's a, uh, it's a flat image of Jesus or the saints. According to them, it's not an idol, but it's a, it's a window to heaven to connect with heaven. But it, uh, it wasn't always accepted in that tradition without some controversy. In fact, in uh, 717 to 41, 1741 or 741, this is, Pope, this is Emperor Leo's the third years, he contested this. So he attacks these icons and calls them idols, basically. And this is what we know as the iconoclast controversy. 
these people wanted to destroy these icons. He led the move. Uh, John of Damascus, a name uh, that is common in church history, uh, defended the use of icons, and uh, the Synod 1843 condemned iconoclasts, those who were trying to destroy it and officially approved it. And to this day, as far as my understanding, in the first Sunday of Lent in the Orthodox Church commit, commemorates this victory. So um, we, we probably uh, know people in this movement, that, or at least have retrogressed into it. I, I know of an individual who has moved from the typical reform position back into it. And you probably know others uh, that have done this, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we understand what it is to a point, and in my opinion, uh, I'm a bit mystified as to why, <laughs> why you would leave the foundation of justification by faith and move into this domain. But this was a very important event in the church. Uh, again, 1054 was the official split and to this day, there is a separation between Rome and the Orthodox. And that, that movement has moved up through Middle Europe into Russia, et cetera. So that brings us to another consideration, and this is um, a, a call to reform. And we've seen this from the outset as we've surveyed church history, that right from the second century, there have been people who wanted to bring reform to the church per se, as they saw it. But what's interesting, and we saw that in the monastic movement, that what's interesting, most of the time, those people who started in that stream of monasticism, they would go into monasteries. So there was almost this dual idea, well, you have one level of spirituality, that's the normal participant in the church, and then you had these, let's just say, segregated groups that were off and they were in some respects more spiritual. At this juncture of church history though, uh, and we're looking to the 12th and 13th century, uh, just a quick look at these reform movements, that's not the case. The, these reformers <clears throat> stayed in the mainstream of society. And what, what we want to look at is pretty much what their message was and then what the official, how the official church responded to them. That, that's going to be the interesting issue. And again, I quote Shelley, uh, he's quoting uh, Robert Gostetsta, the Bishop of Lincoln, England, 1235 to 1253. So this guy, quote, attacked covetous greed and an immorality of the clergy. As the life of pastors is the book of the laity, it is manifest that such as these are the preachers of all error and wickedness. The foundation of all this, said Grosset, is the Roman court. So his, his contention, as far as I understand, and just a little bit of background there, was that the, the church, the average clergyman of the church was really not meeting the needs of the people. And there, there was a hunger for, let's just say, clergy that would be on their level and actually minister to them in the so-called pastoral office. So we had a couple names here, Arnold of Brescia. And the, these guys' message, well, well, let's return to apostolic poverty, okay? Because they saw the corruption and grandeur of the church. And, and this guy... Uh, relinquished his property, sold it, uh, and then uh, went into this movement, but he fell afoul of the church, this uh, Arnold of Brescia, because he, he led a, a movement against papal dominion. So he was calling the church to relinquish all property and secular domain, and uh, he unfortunately got up, uh, got on the wrong end of the, the uh, Inquisition was executed and his ashes were thrown in the Tiber River. That's 1155. Another name, which if you have any, let's just say general knowledge of church history, you, you've probably heard of the Waldensians. These were found by Peter Waldo, 1144 to 12, 1140 to 1218. And he was a rich merchant from Lyons, France. He gave away his estate hired two priests to translate the Latin scriptures into French. Okay, now that's, that's interesting. 
and this is um, 11, 4 to 12, uh, 18. This is bef before Wycliffe, Huss, Tyndale, etc. But there was a move. This, this was, in my opinion, a rather bold move to say, hey, we want these scriptures to now be translated into the use of Sequendwe, or the common language. So his followers traveled in pairs and, quote, explained the scriptures. And now when we, when, we, when we see this type of statement in this context, we have to realize, okay, their exegesis is in the background of the Catholic tradition, okay? Although, in many respects, there was benefits to it because this movement is calling the church back to apostolic poverty, away from what they could view as the corruption. Well, the movement spread south. He's eventually excommunicated 1184, and the goal to purify the church as they promoted it was eventually stammered by the Inquisition. But some of the things they were rejecting was the authority of the church, and notably so, because as I mentioned earlier, you had this process or this practice of simony and lay investiture, which was being thwarted, and they didn't want to submit to the pope. They rejected feast days, et cetera, et cetera, and um, that that was their movement. So there's a question that comes out of this: Were were these people uh, pre-reformers? And this other movement kind of answers the question. And when I mean pre-reformers, were they, were, were they setting the stage for the Reformation to come? Well, in some ways they were because they were challenging the church, challenging the church. But there was not the purity of arriving at the true gospel. And, and one movement, uh, the Cathari, uh, which was actually, uh, and you, again, you may have heard that name, they, they were resurrecting old hardcore Gnosticism tension of good and evil, uh, misconception of the God of the Old Testament, and, and we've talked about that, uh, and just the whole mindset of uh, asceticism, no marriage, uh, no meat, etc. The end of these people, though, was the Inquisition had to wipe them out. Uh, and that brings us then to the last thing that we want to consider, and on your outline there, this inquisition as we know it, and that, that usually has a bad name to it, and it should, I suppose, uh, and you probably know it from Hollywood, <laughs> but this is, this is what the church was attempting to do with heretics, okay, how, how to stop these heresies from, um, let's just say, challenging the church, and it, it was a progression, 1184, Pope Lucius, uh, commanded the bishops to make inquiry into what the people believed. By 1215, Innocent stated the punishment for heretics. Uh, 1220, uh, Inquisition was taken from the bishops and given to the Dominican order, and they pursued it rather aggressively. And a uh, heretic had no rights, so if you were called to an Inquisition, you had no rights. Uh, the Inquisitor was the law, submissive only to the Pope, and by 1252, torture was sanctioned, and uh, then the heretic then was eventually given over to the civil authorities for execution, and we'll see this happen. Now, the, the, there's, a, there's an uncomfortable historical fact that I think needs to be reconciled here, in that we have a tendency as evangelicals to look at the Protestant or look at the Catholics and this say and say, well, this was horrible. And it was. Yes, it was not legitimate. But I didn't know this. And, and according to Shelley, uh, between four and five thousand Anabaptist believers were executed by fire, water, or the sword during the Reformation. So this you're probably familiar with Zwingli in Zurich, and we'll touch on that next time. And when the Anabaptist movement arose in that context, and these people who said, no, we don't want infant baptism, quote, state baptism, we, we believe that baptism is only for believers. That's us, right? Yeah, 
Anna, again, baptized. And uh, so these people stood up to the reformers, uh, Zwingli, in, in particular there in Zurich, and said, no, we don't, we, don't, we don't want to conscribe to that. Well, Felix Manns then was drowned. And like I said, I gave you that statistic. And, and we're going up a couple centuries after this, but this would have been the 15th century or 16th century probably and on, as Shelley says, that four to 5,000 people were uh, either executed by fire, water, or sword because of their Anabaptist persuasions. So that, that fact calls for some hum humility in our tradition to say, oh, wait a second. <laughs> the traditions that we, we so much hold to <clears throat> that there were people in it as well that, that, <clears throat> that did not have the ability to say, OK, you're different in this. We're not going to accept this. Uh, and we're, we're going to excommunicate you or, or, or do something to get you out of the fellowship, but that's rather drastic. So in some respects, like I said, that, that humbles us to put the Inquisition in perspective and realizing that the Protestant church has made some mistakes as well. So by way of application, um, I'll just close with this. We, we've looked at the tension of control between the state in the church, in the church, in the state. But just remember this, <laughs> that the state is a religion, OK? It's, it's not a new, neutral, secular power. So when you see the state trying to control the church, whether it was then or now, uh, you, you, all have, you always have to kind of put that in the proper context. And then another application, I, I think it's important, that history, history is, is a record of conquest fueled by various motivations. So don't oversimplify it. So these people that throw at us, well, what about the Crusades? And I say, well, what about them? It's just another war of conquest in antiquity. And I'm not saying it was right, but to, to, to take that and baptize that into your rhetoric to defend yourself as being, quote, a virtue signaler and you're better than everybody else, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, I think you have to be careful of that. And then this inquisition, you know, by the Catholic Church, yes, it was not a good thing. It's the wrong way to uh, stifle error. Uh, but then again, as I mentioned, by way of humility, we have to realize that the Protestant tradition particularly there, from what I understand, in Zurich and Geneva, there, or in Zurich and uh, Switzerland there, um, that a lot of Anabaptists perished for their faith. And again, that, that's news to me. I just read that statistic in Shelley. And then finally, that this ongoing monster in the church, materialism, OK? When it, when it takes its hold, and like I said, we, we do have a tendency to look at the church in the Middle Ages, the Roman tradition, and, it's, and it's how lucrative it was in many respects. And, and then we've looked very briefly at the attempts to reform it and say, yeah, that, that's a challenge. But can, can we look at the evangelical church today? <laughs> and some of the edifices that we've built, and they're good, but then when we're considering, as we discuss very often here, and appropriately so, the confrontation of society that we need to proceed with regarding honoring the law of God, that how many churches will say, well, we, we don't want to go that route because look, look, what, look what we've built. <laughs> so that's, that's a hard question. And I'll close the door on that one. And the next lecture <clears throat> will be primarily biography because we're going to look into the Reformation era and uh, look at some minor characters there. Amen. <laughs>